Hello, my dear viewers. This amazing story will be very instructive for you. It is very interesting and beautiful. I wish you enjoy watching it. Martin Hanks woke up to a persistent morning call on his phone. Michelle, what do you want so early? He asked in a sleepy voice. Martin Hanks, we've been waiting for you. The whole office is ready for an efficient day's work. When can we expect you? Michelle, my joy. Remember, at last, please. I can be disturbed if I need to report something really important. Being ready for the workday is the normal order of things. It can't be any other way, Martin Hanks said. And if I missed you, is that an important reason or not? Michelle asked. I miss you too. Be patient. I'll be there later, Martin said, and hung up. He realized he hadn't slept well, but Martin wasn't used to sleeping in in the morning, so he had to get up and go to his office after all. Michelle met him at the exit of the elevator. She immediately hung onto his neck, then took him by the elbow, and together they headed to his office and garage. I have planned our New Year's vacation. Look tour to Bali for 30 cheaper. What do you think? Michelle asked. At that moment, there was a knock on the door, and without waiting for the boss to answer, the door opened, and Harry the architect entered. Good morning, Martin Hanks. Hi, Michelle. I'm here with the project loads. Harry, as always, you're very bad. Tempered, Michelle walked up to him, turned him around, patted him on the shoulder, and sent him out the door. Martin Hanks looked at all this in bewilderment. Michelle, what are you doing? Harry and I have to approve the master plan for the new project today. Why did you kick him out the door? Michelle laughed and said, You be careful with that, Harry, because he looks back at me a lot. I'm afraid he might have his eye on you, too. Michelle laughed even louder. So what about the tour? Shall we book it? Michelle sat on Martin's lap and asked affectionately. The new year is still three months away. I don't think we should rush into it. Whatever you say, dear. Then let's plan the next events. You do remember that next week is my parents' anniversary, right? I promised to come to the party with you. Why did you make that promise without consulting me? Martin Hanks asked. Would you say no? Martin, what does that mean? You and I have been dating for two years. I can't even invite you to my parents' party. They've been asking about you for a long time. You've been promising to meet and get to know them for a year now. Martin Hanks covered his face with his hands, sat for a while in a mysterious silence. Then he took his leather wallet out of his pocket, pulled out some green bills, and put them in Michael's lap. Here's my contribution to the celebration. Enough here for you to buy a beautiful dress to outshine everyone and some more to relax in the spa the next day. Now I have work to do. Shell took the bills, rolled them up into a tube, and buried them deep in her cleavage. Then she kissed Hanks on the bald spot and finally left the office. Get Harry. Let him carry the project, said Martin Hanks after her. The week flew by unnoticed, and the day of Michelle's parents' anniversary came. By this time, she had picked out a fancy dress. She went to the makeup artist early in the morning and waited for the call from Martin, all dressed up. The time was approaching evening, but there was no call. Michelle tried calling herself, but his phone was out of range. Michelle was very nervous, and to dampen her emotions, she went to the kitchen for a minute to get another drink. Just then, the phone rang. She rushed to the phone and saw an unfamiliar number. She was sure it was Martin Hanks. Hello, Michelle. Greetings. How are you spending your night off? I'm fine. It's me, Harry. I didn't recognize it. Then I'll be rich, Harry. Are you going to be rich? Maybe only in the next life, but now please don't disturb my peace. I have grand plans for tonight, Michelle said. No matter how hard Harry tried to strike up a conversation, it didn't click. It annoyed her. Eventually, the conversation ended with Michelle just hanging up. Further attempts to reach Martin yielded no results. Michelle didn't want to admit that. 
In fact, Martin had bought off the idea with money a week earlier. She still hoped that he would go with her, but she couldn't wait any longer, or she would definitely miss the gala event. By then, the girl had had time to experience both anger and resentment, disappointment, remorse, and love for Martin. In fact, Martin Hanks used to do this to her all the time, but nothing is sure to come back to him. And this time, he won't get away with three green bills. Michelle had a brilliant idea at this point. In her mind, she pulled out her phone and dialed the last number. Harry, I take it you're free tonight. I have a little favor to ask of you. I'd even say a suggestion. Can I count on you? She changed her tone. Harry was only glad of that. I'm all ears. Right now, you need to put on your best suit, meet the gorgeous lady at her doorstep, and rush off to the gala event. My parents are having a dinner party, but most of the guests are friends and relatives. I'd be bored on my own. Do you want to keep me company? No problem. I'll give you the address. I'll tell you in how many seconds I'll be at your feet. Michelle patiently sat down to wait for Harry. In the meantime, she called her mother and told her that she was coming with her friend, since her potential son-in-law was, as usual, busy with important matters and could not attend the event. Daughter, I've been telling you from the beginning that Martin is not your man. Maybe it's better that every time it doesn't work out with him. You should take a closer look at this friend. Maybe he'll be more useful. You won't be wasting your time. Youth passes. Well, Mom, let's talk about it some other time, okay? Don't get distracted now. We'll be right there. The party was in full swing. The guests were having fun making toasts and generously complimenting each other. Everyone was in high spirits except Michelle. Harry did not take one step away from her, gently wooing her and trying his best to please her parents. In the back of his mind, he was determined to continue the evening privately with Michelle. She, on the other hand, was sitting at the table, drinking and constantly looking at her phone. What was going on around her was of little interest to her. At one point, she turned pale, dizzy, and had trouble breathing. Harry started screaming and calling for help, but his voice was interrupted by the loud music. Michelle falling to the floor, few of the guests noticed because of the dim lighting in the restaurant. Her phone had fallen out of her hands and remained lying under the table. Harry carefully picked the girl up and led her out into the fresh air. Outside, she recovered a little. At that time, Michelle's mother, Elizabeth Mitchell, walked by the table and noticed her daughter's phone, which had left her social media accounts open. She picked up the phone and saw pictures of a certain happy, middle-aged couple on the screen. She recognized the man in the photo as Martin, the man Michelle had told her so much about, and showed her pictures off. Her mother shook her head, locked the machine, and went in search of her daughter. She found her and a friend sitting on the restaurant porch. Michelle was crying quietly, and Harry was wiping away her tears and trying his best to comfort her. Her mother approached her silently, held her in her arms, and put the phone in her hands. She gave her a look that made it clear she understood what had happened and her girl's condition. Michelle said, Mom, I want to go home. Tell Dad not to be offended that we didn't stay until the end of the celebration. Yes, my daughter. Gary, will you walk my daughter home? Or shall we send someone close to her? No, no, don't worry, Elizabeth Mitchell. I'll drive her myself. Michelle awoke the next morning with a terrible headache and nausea but could not remember how Harry had brought her home or when he himself had left, only the crumpled bed, silent as to how Harry had not immediately gone home after bringing Michelle to her apartment. Martin Hanks returned from his honeymoon rested and refreshed. None of his staff knew about the marriage. The man has such principles. He does not mix his personal life with business relationships. Only Michelle had no intention of accepting that principle. She barely waited for him to return from his trip and go to work. She analyzed Martin's behavior lately and realized that he had changed a long time ago. He often started ignoring her and practically stopped going out with her to events together. Michelle now understood everything. It was over in hindsight. 
But she disagreed with that outcome and decided nothing was over. Everything was just beginning. On the first day Martin Hanks came to work, Michelle was already waiting for him at the office. Realizing that the conversation was going to be difficult, Martin Hanks himself was the first to start. Yes, Michelle, I am guilty before you. I tried to talk to you many times, but you did not give me a chance. I have no excuses now. You are still young, beautiful, promising. I think you will meet your man. Who is she? Michelle asked, not taking her eyes off her. We had known each other for a long time, about ten years. Back then, my late wife was still alive, and we communicated as a family. Don't get me wrong. I have a child and a very complicated child. I really needed a woman who was calmer and more at home or something. And how do you see our future going forward? I'd like you to stay on. I'll sign a raise to your salary today. And I really want you to be happy. You can look out for promising guys your own age, but I'm always there for you. So for two years, you've been leading me around by the nose. And now you're telling me to look out for others. Aren't you going to say anything about my feelings? As is typical of most men, Martin Hanks, naturally, did not like and was not able to talk about abstract categories, such as women's feelings. So he tried in every way to offer Michelle concrete career prospect. She realized there was no chance of turning back, so she agreed to all the preferences offered. If she had wondered before whether to leave her job or stay, now came the clarity. She would not leave until she had avenged her betrayal and made this Martin suffer. On her return from her honeymoon, Mary took charge of Ashley's health. The girl is going to a school for special children this year. It was painful for Mary to watch a child born perfectly healthy lose the gift of speech. Ashley lost her hearing and speech after a tragic accident that killed her mother. Five years have passed since then. Martin Hanks has made many attempts to restore the health of his daughter, but so far all to no avail. Recently, one of the teachers advised that the girl has not interfered with a close female company. This advice was the reason for Martin Hanks, finally, to propose to Mary. She first researched about the phenomenon of, of everything that was available, then made a list of possible treatments, including even the folk in unconventional ways. A mutual family friend recommended a doctor with a proven reputation. Mary took Ashley to the doctor. He reassured them that all would be well, and with the best of luck, the girl would speak within one or two years. But an important condition was stability in the treatment. Mary agreed without hesitation to take Ashley twice a week to sessions with the doctor. On her way back after her appointment, Mary decided to turn to her grandmother's healer. After all, before medicine reached its current level, everyone was treated by such grandmothers. Can many diseases be cured? Could it help? She looked at the girl, stroked her hair, and told Mary that the problem was relatively simple. It was enough to perform three full moon rites, and a cause should arise in the girl's life that would cause her the same intense experiences as the accident, only in a positive way, and then most likely the girl would talk. Mary found this argument persuasive. Then the healer read the girl a certain prayer, made her a talisman, and told her to wear it in her pocket at all times and tie a white ribbon on her left hand. At the end, she made some other ritual, and then she took some tar and smeared it on the child's forehead. Don't wash off the tar until tonight. Let it go like that, the grandmother said. Despite the fact that Mary and Ashley had only met a few months earlier, the woman was well-versed in sign language. On the way home, they stopped at a cozy roadside cafe and enjoyed the girls' favorite pastries with their hands and facial expressions. They understood each other perfectly, shared their thoughts, and even had fun. When they didn't make it home and were waiting for the elevator on the landing, they met some grandmother. She first looked at Ashley, then looked up and down at Mary. Who are you, young lady? A relative of Ashley's. Yes. I guess you could say that I am. Mary was a little embarrassed and tried to ignore such close attention from the unfamiliar, nosy grandmother. But Ashley made it clear that she was their neighbor. You and I are neighbors, so my name is Clara Johnson. 
So he's done with the bachelor life after all. And I've told him many times there must be a mistress in the house. And that at least the child needs a close. What kind of person does he need? But how do you feel about children? Do you have any yourself? Mary was taken aback by this aggressive intrusion into her personal area. She ignored her grandmother's questions. By this time, they had reached their floor. Mary politely invited Clara Johnson to stop by for tea, wished her a good evening, and she and Ashley headed for their door. Clara Johnson, looking at the white ribbon on Ashley's hands and the tar on her forehead, guessed at once where the woman had taken the girl. She waited in the stairwell until Mary and Ashley were out the door. And as she opened her apartment, Clara Johnson muttered to herself, some kind of witch. I'd better take a closer look at her. After a serious conversation with Hanks, Michelle took a few days off and returned to work just today. She looked good and smiled enigmatically at everyone. On her first day at work, Michelle headed to Martin Hanks' office in the morning. Martin, I've been thinking, and I've made up my mind. A woman, if she loves, should be able to let a man go. I have loved you all these years, and I sincerely wish you to be happy, and I am always ready to be by your side. It's enough for me to see you and make sure you're doing well. So let's forget our difficult conversation, but I need time and effort to accept the new reality. I've decided to redecorate my apartment. Will you give me some money? Martin Hanks has it like a stone off his chest. Yeah, renovations are a good thing. Go ahead, we'll figure something out with the expenses. Michelle wasn't satisfied with that answer. She continued to speculate to Martin about her feelings and resentment. And in the end, by the evening, she managed to get quite a solid amount of cash from Martin Hanks. Now she was free to proceed with her plan. Of course, she had no intention of making any repairs. Putting a large sum of money in her purse, Michelle went to the next apartment. It was the sales department, where Maria, the most responsible employee, worked. Maria's job is hard. Usually by evening, she was very tired from active communication with different people. Maria, hi, you're on fire today, working for three people. Thanks to you, our company is on its feet, but I see you are a little tired. I'm overworked today, too. I know an interesting place near here. Let's sit down after work. Have some Venetian food and a nice glass of wine. My treat. Michelle smiled kindly. Maria was really tired and did not mind distracting herself at once, agreeing to such a pleasant proposal. Maria expected a heartfelt lady's talk after a small amount of drinking. She did not notice that all the conversations turned smoothly to the topic of work. Michelle listened with sincere interest to Maria's stories about which partners she could not reach an agreement with and which were about to sign new contracts. She inadvertently gave out detailed terms of cooperation with new partners. Michelle easily managed to get all the information she needed. The next day, Michelle was, as usual, performing her job duties as a secretary. During the day, she had a large number of phone calls on behalf of her supervisor, and no one was usually interested in who she was talking to, or what she was talking to, or what she was talking about. The conversation with Graham Building Company Martin Hanks' chief competitor from the outside seemed like one of those unremarkable phone calls. Michelle had no trouble getting into the sales department of a rival company, since that department of a rival company, since that department itself is a big hunter for every incoming call. The girl introduced herself as an interpreter for a large international trading firm that was planning to build a logistics center and a large office building in this city. She added that the project had to be started as soon as possible and that it was urgent to get a quote from the construction company. After receiving it, Michelle waited for a call back from the person in charge of the Green Building Company. When the representative called Michelle, posing as a cranky but very potential partner, informed her that the managers of the international company were waiting for proposals in order to start the construction as soon as possible. She added that the company had already received an offer from Mega House and listed all the conditions. The representative of the competitor was immensely pleased with such detailed information, 
and in the next few days sent a new commercial proposal, where all conditions were much better than those offered by the grand building. Michelle worked with all the other companies according to the same scheme and managed to get a unique commercial offer from each of them. In the end, the cooperation with Mega House turned out to be unprofitable. The deadlines are long, prices are high, quality assurance is minimal, and there are no additional options. Michelle sent the new unique offers she received to all the potential partner companies on Maria's list. This meant that all of Martin Hank's potential company partners just flew into his competitors' pockets. He was hopeful about these contracts and comfortable with the immediate future of his company. At this time, Mary and Ashley were getting ready for another session at the doctor's office. As they were leaving the apartment, the doorbell rang. Mary opened it and saw an unfamiliar woman in front of her. Where is Martin? Where is my granddaughter? said the stranger without saying hello. Martin is at work. Ashley is going to the doctor's office with me. And you are. I guess Gwen Austin. Ashley's grandmother. Yes, and I need to see my granddaughter. Gwen Austin, without waiting for an invitation, burst into the apartment. At that moment, Ashley ran out of her room and approached her grandmother. She patted her hair and began to examine her granddaughter vigorously, groping her body at the same time. Oh, what a poor thing. My God, how tortured you are. You would have been much better off with me. Gwen Austin continued to wail. You know, Ashley is fine. We're going to see a good doctor now. He promises to have results in a few months, and she's doing well academically. That's what it looks like to you, dearie. Gwen Austin turned to the woman and stared menacingly at her. How do you know what she's like? You've never raised a child in your life, and my child can't say what's in her heart. Martin's always busy with his work and the baby needs a caring hand. She's all gaunt and gaunt. Dear God, what is all this for me? If my daughter were alive, would her little girl be suffering like this? Gwen Austin did not let up. You pack her things now. I'm taking her to my place for a week. Let the child rest. Gain strength to disperse. I'm sorry, Gwen Austin, but I don't think Martin would approve. Especially now Ashley and I are actively involved in her health. We can't miss any sessions. It was like she needed an excuse. She cried, continued wailing, and dialed Martin's number. But he didn't answer. When the woman realized that Mary wasn't going to fall for her manipulation, she decided to go another way. She promised him that she would never let her granddaughter suffer in the hands of a stranger, and that she herself could raise the girl on her feet and provide a decent life. Eventually, she slammed the door and left. Mary decided to call Martin herself and tell him what had happened. In the meantime, Gwen Austin had time to think of something and knocked on the neighbor's door in the stairwell. Within minutes, as Mary and Ashley were leaving the apartment, Gwen Austin and Clara Johnson were already sitting at the same table, actively discussing their lives. Gwen, I'll tell you more. She's a witch. I saw with my own eyes how she took your granddaughter to some sorcerers, and they tied all kinds of ribbons around her and covered her face with pitch, and your child walked around like that for days. Can you imagine how horrible that was? That's all I need. No, Clara, I'm not going to leave it at that. I've been dreaming about my granddaughter for days now. I feel she's suffering. Of course, it suffers if you leave her in a stranger's woman and let her loose on everything. You please keep a close eye on this woman and let me know right away if anything happens. I told her right away to take my granddaughter away from me and give her to some unknown woman who has no maternal love is sacrilege. But how can you change this stubborn man's mind? Now I'm sorry I gave in, but I'm not going to let it go, and I'm going to take my granddaughter with me, and that's that, Gwen Austin said firmly. Now, Clara Johnson had a new and exciting thing to do, to watch her new neighbor's every move. At this time, somewhere in the yard near the playground, on a bench, sat a young girl in dark glasses and looked closely at the entrance where Martin Hanks lives. She walked around the yard for a while, looking closely at every passerby, and seemed to be up to something. 
After a while, the girl hurriedly left the yard, though with the intention of returning. The next day, when Martin Hanks arrived at work, Michelle took a couple of hours off, explaining that she needed to go to the doctor. She left the office and went straight to Martin Hanks' house. There had been a time when she had stayed overnight here more than once, so she knew enough about Martin's life. Michelle stepped into the entryway and went up to the familiar floor. Only she didn't go to Martin Hanks' wrenching story of how devotedly she had loved Martin Hanks, how much he had promised her, and how mean he had been to her in the end. She accompanied her story with tears, a tear that deeply affected Clara Johnson's, who has had a lifelong attraction to saving the suffering. She added, for herself, I saw this upstart. She's not going to bring good to this house. Martin's mother-in-law came to see me. His daughter's grandmother was in tears, too. That woman is abusing his child. I saw her take the little girl to witches. She will ruin Martin himself. Oh, Martin doesn't even know that. On the contrary, he hopes she will take care of his daughter. He told me he married her because she was nice to his child. So she cheated. Maybe she used witchcraft on him, too. And who knows what keeps her from doing what she wants. What about Martin? Men are like children. Where they're lured, they go. Now it's clear what you're lured by. The idea of witchcraft appealed to Michelle. In the course of the conversation, she thought of how this idea could be cleverly used to her advantage. Clara Johnson, did you know that witchcraft makes people crazy over time? Martin is all right. He's a grown man. At least he can figure it out. But the little girl, I think someone has to save her. If you and I know everything that goes on behind these walls and keep quiet about it, I don't think even God would forgive us. How are we going to save her? They forbid the girl to see even her own grandmother. Soon they'll lock her up at home and stop showing her to anyone. And then that witch will use the child as an excuse to keep Martin on her leash as long as possible. Michelle cried, I grew up in my stepmother's arms. I know what it is. The girl lied unscrupulously. You are in all your misery, hoping that someone will understand your pain and save you. But I was wrong to hope for adults. No one ever thought to think about me. Michael continued to play the innocent victim, and eventually they agreed that the girl suffered terribly from Mary's presence, and that they should do whatever they could to rid the family of it. Michelle unobtrusively advised Clara how this could be done. The girl pulled out two large bills and placed them on her new alley desk. It was ostensibly payment for her participation in the noble cause of saving the little neighbor from her wicked stepmother. She immediately took them and put them in her pocket, and Clara Johnson now sincerely believed that she was part of an important cause. In the evening, Mary told Martin that her grandmother had come and intended to take Ashley away for a while. Martin became angry and firmly told her that his daughter had a family and that she had a right to grow up near her own father. But what to do with Gwen Austin? Martin had no idea yet, either. Martin Hanks began the new workday with a general meeting. He told his staff that the latest project was coming to a successful conclusion and would be delivered to the customer. The other day he said that the client really liked this project and a lot of other people now on new tasks need to be held to the same standards. Then he turned to Maria. Maria, what about our new contracts? Who do we have coming up? A big international company. They need to start construction right away. I'm negotiating with them now. We offered them the best conditions. I think they will make a final decision in the next few days, and we will sign the contract. Maria, why did the negotiations take so long? Usually people decide within one or two months, but it took them a long time to look at our terms. I recommend speeding up the negotiation process and having an agreement ready by next week. We should not allow any downtime. After the meeting was over, Maria returned to her office and dialed the number of the international company representative. Until today, Maria was sure that everything was going as it should. But the firm's representative spoke very differently today. Maria Johnson, you have gone to great lengths to offer us the best terms. 
We are almost finished with the proposal review phase, and our management has made their final decision. We are signing a contract with Grand Building Company and will be starting construction soon. And I convey our thanks to you on behalf of our management team. We look forward to doing business with you someday, he said. Maria was taken aback by the surprise. Okay, stop. I'm sorry, I don't understand. We have developed unique conditions, especially for you. We met you on all counts, adapted the entire estimate to your budget. Schedule A so that you have time to meet your target date, provide you with all the necessary guarantees. And what prompted you on this background? Make a decision in favor of the grand building? Maria Johnson, I believe this will be a completely useless conversation that will take up my and your valuable time. We have made our final decision. If there are any changes, I will call you myself. I wish you a productive day at work, the employee said, and hung up. Maria then called the other four companies, each of which Mega House, under the direction of Martin Hanks, had developed special terms and were committed to meeting them. Everything was going as planned. New contracts were on the way. Today, however, all the firms were talking differently. Some of them refused to cooperate at all. Others had opted for a competitor. Maria was dumbfounded by this turn of events. On cotton legs, she went to Martin Hanks' office and told everything as it was. He was very angry and accused Maria of a loss of competence. It is the best price. Here's a full set of equipment, the right amount of manpower. Here's a team of professionals. Here's your willingness to work 24-7 and deliver the project sooner than you expect. But you see, at the very last moment, everything falls apart. Maria Johnson, whose fault do you think this is? Maria sat silent, unable to find an answer. Martin Hanks put in some tough terms. But it's not that bad. You have four or five days to find at least two new companies and sign contracts with them. Maria Johnson, at any cost. Otherwise, we'll have to say goodbye to you. Maria went back to her office as she was on cotton legs. This news made Martin Hanks quite nervous. Never before in his practice had he been so badly let down at the very last moment. In the evening, he hurried home to rest and gather with his closest people after a hard day's work. On the way, he stopped by his wife's work and picked her up. Together, they drove to pick up Ashley and pick her up from the school for special children. Mary cooked dinner and set the holiday table for no particular reason. She loved to throw celebrations without looking back on the calendar to cheer up the man she loved and the equally beloved Ashley. Just as they sat down at the table, the doorbell rang. Martin Hanks decided to meet the named guest himself and went to open it. On the threshold stood Gwen Austin. Oh, what a surprise. Hello, come in. We're just about to have dinner, so why don't you join us? Gwen Austin was not in the mood. She went silently into the kitchen and sat down at the table. So it's just the two of you? Ashley, eating apart from you? No, we haven't started yet. Ashley's in her room. She should be here any minute. How can we sit at the table without her? Martin Hank said. Martin, I realized I made a mistake when I gave Ashley to you. I think she would be better off with me. What can you give? You leave her all day at work with a man who is virtually a stranger to her. Mary is no stranger to her. They get along well and spend a lot of time together. Yes, I can see how well she's doing. The baby has become drained. She's starting to shun me. How do you know when you see her once a day? My mother-in-law wouldn't let up. When? Let's close this conversation once and for all. Ashley has a family. She has a family. And she has every right to grow up with her father. Yes, I'm very grateful to you for helping raise my daughter through a difficult time. But let's keep respect for each other and not come back to this issue, Martin Hanks said firmly. Martin, are you going to tell me how to be? And what to do? Am I a stranger now? I've lost my daughter. Now you're asking me to give up my granddaughter. Gwen Austin began to wail in her own characteristic tone. 
Your daughter's death has been hard on all of us. But understand we can't stay stuck in our grief. Then it will be harder for Ashley to adjust and continue to develop without her mother. It's time for us to accept reality and move on, Martin Hank said. So you move on with your life and give me my baby. You took one child from me and I won't let you take another. Gwen Austin, what are you talking about? What do you mean? I took your child. Are you accusing me of tragedy? Martin Hanks was starting to get a little hot too. My daughter gave you the best years of her life. Everything you've accomplished, you owed to her. She was the one who worked two jobs and fed you both while you promoted your business. She was the one raising the child while you were away on business trips abroad for months on end, carrying the child the house and your worries. Under that kind of stress, of course, any woman would get tired. She had an accident because she was tired to the point of exhaustion. Of that, I have no doubt, Martin. Blaming me for the death of my wife is too much for you. She and I had a wonderful life. I never devalued her contribution to our family. And your accusation in this case is simply immoral. Gwen Austin and Martin Hanks got into a heated argument. Ashley watched the whole process at the entrance to the kitchen. Mary tried to pull her aside, but the girl didn't want to. Though she couldn't hear or respond, she was well aware of the constant arguments between her father and grandmother. It was because of her, she had always at such times tried to smooth over the conflict in any way she could, and this time she could not stand by and simply watch what was going on. Ashley silently walked over to her grandmother, put her arms around her, and kissed her on the cheek, then placed her palms on her face. She looked intently into her eyes and turned away then walked over to Martin Hanks and climbed onto his lap with both hands, hugged her father tightly, and stayed in that position. It didn't take a man to master sign language to properly interpret these movements. It meant that Ashley was grateful to her grandmother and loved her. But she preferred to live with her father in her home. Mary went into the other room because she couldn't bear to see this woman piss her husband off with her unfounded accusations and claims. The argument went on for a long time. Eventually, Gwen Austin left without even drinking her tea. But the mood of the family was completely spoiled, but that was not all. The most important consequence of this conversation was waiting for the family the next day. Michel began to reap the first fruits of his cunning plan. The office is a mess. Martin Hanks flew out on an urgent business trip. Maria runs from morning to evening on negotiations. When things are not in order in the office, it is immediately reflected in the overall atmosphere of the team. If before the employees of Mega House were proud to work for this company and were confident in their prospects, now day by day these illusions are dispelled. This morning, there was an incident at all that caused everyone at the firm to think seriously. The company had a holy morning ritual on arrival to the office, not to immediately get to work and drink tea, coffee, and chat with colleagues about current affairs in the smoking room. I got used to the routine and why bother when the management is not there yet. Today, a spontaneous group of Harry, Michelle, two young engineers, and Kate, the CFO, had gathered in the smoking room. One of the employees, in the course of the usual chatter, shared his optimistic plans for the future. It was one of the young engineers. He was getting married in six months and was actively discussing wedding travel options in the company. Kate heard all this conversation and deliberately waited so that the employees could dream of a bright future. And then she said, I have always been amazed at the naivety of the young. Would you at least check with reality when you make such grand plans for the future, said Kate, letting out a long cigarette smoke from her mouth. Her colleagues looked at her with a mute, questioning look. They knew if Kate said anything, it could be considered information from the most reliable sources, because she managed all the financial flows in the company. Martin Hanks, when there is something important to plan for the future, always does it under Kate's direction. So her words set off alarm bells for the staff. 
but no one dared to specify what exactly it was about. Only Michael added fuel to the fire. We should. Kate Larkin is absolutely right. I've heard we're in for some tough times too. Contracts are being broken one by one right now. If things go on like this, we'll feel the terrible consequences very, very soon. I think Martin Hanks is bound to do something. I mean, he's been in this business for years. He's like a shark in this great sea. Harry was the only one who remained optimistic. Michelle grinned back. Yeah, expect him to be enterprising. In fact, our Martin Hanks is a master at shifting responsibility. I've seen enough crisis cases where he first assigns blame and fires, and it's always been a team effort to get out of crisis situations. So you will all either be fired, or you will have to work like slaves for a few months. And you may even get a pay cut for this period. Why just us? Won't it affect you? One of the young engineers asked naively. Michelle found the question extremely stupid. She did not answer it and just arrogantly ignored the employee. Everyone's mood was ruined. After a couple of minutes, the employees began to leave for their offices. Michelle was in no hurry to leave because she had an important call to make in private. But Harry decided to stick around with her. Michelle, you look especially beautiful today. Do you mean to tell me that the other days I look like a sucker? Michelle rounded her eyes. Know you what? It's just that on other days, I don't always find the opportunity to tell you about it, Harry said. In fact, it was an excuse on my part to invite you to dinner tonight. Thank you, Harry, but I haven't eaten dinner in a long time. It's not healthy to eat at night, Michelle said. Harry knew it wasn't about dinner. If I seemed intrusive, I'm sorry. I see you haven't been yourself lately. Maybe you're having some sort of difficulty or problem. I'd love to help you, but I can't help you, Harry said. It's okay. I really don't eat before going to bed. It helps me look good in the morning, that's all. No other problems. But if it's only about food, then you don't go out to lunch every day, and you probably give your breakfast and dinner to the enemy. Harry tried to lighten the mood. It's a philosophy. Harry. A woman fixated on food cannot exude subtle vibes, harmony, and love. She lives on coarse energies. Very soon this coarse energy, very soon this coarse energy finds embodiment in the form of protruding flanks. And then it's not far to the third chin, Michelle said. I think you don't have to think about problems like that. You have a great figure. You have a well-proportioned physique. I think it's genetic to you. I've seen your parents, and what you've got in your head is just information noise. But seriously, it's not a woman's prerogative to be beautiful. It's a way of life. I'm thinking of getting plastic surgery. That would be a real breakthrough. Michelle's eyes lit up. In your case, it's blasphemy to even think about plastic surgery for your own body. Of course, forgive me if I'm meddling, but I'll stick to my point. You are beautiful just the way you are. You can gain an extra five or fifteen pounds. It won't make you less beautiful, Harry said. But Michelle wasn't convinced by that attitude. She actually, in recent years, drove herself on tough diets because of her young age. She did not realize that the fanatical pursuit of illusory beauty she began with an affair with Martin Hanks. One of the signs of not loving men is the habit of discussing with a woman her appearance helps her find more and more and more imperfections and dress it all up with sauce, honesty, and objectivity. Tell had been sitting on this needle for a long time, but continued to think of this position as her own. And yes, Michelle had not noticed at all that Harry had been very attentive to her behavior lately, as if he were looking for any changes in her eating habits. His concern, one must assume, was justified. In the meantime, a most unexpected guest arrived at Martin Hanks's house. Mary was getting Ashley ready for school when the doorbell rang. Mary opened the door and saw a woman in uniform in front of her. Hello. We are from Child Welfare. The woman opened her ID card right in front of Mary's eyes and quickly put it away in her pocket. I am listening to you. The hostess looked at them with surprise. We need to see the baby, the uniformed woman said, 
and gestured for her colleagues to come into the apartment. She pushed Mary aside and went inside. Ashley was twisting in front of the mirror at this moment, fixing her hair. The strangers went straight to the girl. Mary shouted in their wake, On what grounds do you come to the house? What do you want? We received information that a child was being abused here. We are taking the girl away until the circumstances are clarified, said one of the uninvited guests. You have no right to touch my child. There is no abuse here. This is slander. Mary walked over to Ashley and covered her with her. Girl, what's your name? Don't worry, we're not going to hurt you, the woman said. Ashley was silent and huddled closer to Mary. The custody officers talked among themselves, and the first woman said, In any case, we need to check on your family. There are complaints that you are the one who mistreats the child. We are obligated to take action. The custody officers, when they realized that they had no reason to take the child away, called the police, and they in turn took Mary to the station to find out the circumstances. The police promised to let her go home soon, but Mary did not return that day or three days later. Ashley left alone, stayed home all day. Toward evening, when it was getting frightening, she knocked on Clara Johnson's door. Ashley was holding a piece of paper. It said that the adults weren't home and she was scared alone. She broke the news to Gwen Austin. She came running an hour later and took her granddaughter to her house. Five days later, returning from a business trip, Martin Hanks heard about the incident from Clara. He rushed to the police station, but there he was told that a child abuse case had been filed against Clara and that law enforcement had time to schedule a court hearing that would determine the punishment for Mary, depending on the degree of her guilt. Martin Hanks was furious. He promptly hired an attorney for his wife. Gwen Austin acted as plaintiff in the trial, and Clara Johnson testified against Mary. Both women said with one voice that Mary had brought unhappiness and trouble to the house, but they could offer no concrete evidence. So the judge decided to impose a verdict based on little Ashley's position. He invited her into the courtroom. A specialist in working with special children was also present. As Ashley entered the courtroom, she glanced around at everyone present, her gaze settling on the woman who was sitting next to the lawyer. She immediately ran up to the woman and cuddled up to her. Mary hugged the girl and wiped away the tears on her face. An expert using sign language. Something informed Ashley. The girl froze in silence, then made her way to the judge's table. Standing beside her, she looked at the specialist and made some hand gestures. She told the judge that the girl was asking for a sheet of paper and a pen. Ashley took the sheet and leisurely wrote a few words, then handed it to the judge. He froze for a few moments, then unfolded the sheet to the entire audience. It said, Mary never hurt me. Please don't put her in jail. I won't feel well without her. Those sitting in the audience applauded. The judge read the ruling that Mary was released from the courtroom. Martin Hanks made his conclusions and returned to his normal rhythm of life. Gwen Austin Clara Johnson's plans to remove Mary from Martin Hanks' life failed utterly. For lack of any real reason, Clara Johnson was a little upset after the trial. She expected that Michael might come forward and demand her money back. In her mind, she was picking her arguments just in case, preparing for such an encounter. On the other hand, she realized the fight wasn't over yet. Neither Michelle nor Gwen Austin had achieved their goals, so Clara Johnson as an alley would be of use to them more than once, which meant she could still count on generous new gifts. It really didn't take long for Michelle to show up. She knocked on her neighbor's apartment that same evening to find out the details of the court hearing. Upon hearing the outcome, Michelle was also upset. She didn't ask for her investment back, but it was clear from her demeanor that she would not offer Clara any more money. Then she decided to try to keep her benefactor herself. I think this Martin guy bribed the judge. I heard with my own ears the yelling and the noise from the apartment. All of this has been going on recently. Even Gwen Austin had to come and deal with them. And the judge ignored it all. I think we need to keep fighting this witch. And I'm not just going to let this matter go, Clara resented. 
Martin will soon have nothing to bribe the right people with. So not on this front, but on the other one, they will surely pay. Michelle said calmly, implying her cunning plan for the collapse of the company Mega House had worked. After sitting for a while, Michelle was about to leave. Clara Johnson escorted her to the doorstep and waited for the customary ritual. She wanted a new tranche from Michelle for her alliance. This time the girl made surprised eyes. I'm sorry, but you have failed in your task. You should have made more arguments against Mary at the trial. You must have been ill, prepared. Clara was hurt by this remark. They started arguing among themselves on the landing and Mary heard a noise in the entryway and looked out the door to see what was going on. Clara and Michael did not notice in the dark and continued their argument. Clara Johnson spoke in a burst of emotion. You're the one who needs this, Martin. If you really love him, as you said yourself, then keep acting until you get rid of this woman. Your Martin is no good for you, and I'm the only one who can help you in this case because I can see their every move, knowing all the events in their family. That's the only ally you'll ever find. Mary was speechless at what she heard. She took a step into the entryway and the lights came on automatically. Both women looked at her. Michelle realized that she had nothing more to lose. This was all the more, the first time she'd had such a chance to go through the motions. Hello, Mary. You don't know me, so you live your life in peace. I've been seeing Martin for three years and he's got you wrapped around his finger so he can pin his daughter's care on you. Well, I hear you're doing pretty well, though maybe not well. Keep up the good work, and Martin goes out and has fun with me. So the business trip, do you think it was a business trip? Mary couldn't find the strength to listen to this conversation any further. She walked back into the apartment and slammed the door behind her. Martin Hanks did not wait long, and in half an hour he was home. His wife told him what she had heard in the entryway. At first he tried to deny everything, but the woman's arguments were reasonable. Martin, how could you? You were free to choose. I never pressured you. I thought we got married consciously, like mature people. Yes, but that was all in the past. There was a time when I was trying to take my mind off everything that was weighing on me at the time. And this fool made up love where there wasn't any. Some kind of relationship. You have no reason to doubt me. Believe me, I'll fire her tomorrow. Martin Hanks pleaded. So she works for you too. Mary was shocked. She had never meddled in her husband's affairs or taken an interest in his subordinates, considering it personal territory. All Martin Hanks realized was that he had made a big mistake. Further conversations went nowhere. Mary was already deaf to his arguments. The next day, Martin Hanks did not go to work and stayed home all day. He was worried that his resentful wife might leave him, but she woke up earlier than Martin that day, woke Ashley unnoticed, and managed to leave by her usual route. Martin spent the day thinking about how to mend his relationship with his wife. On the other hand, the state of affairs in the company's office was bothering him. It had been several months since it had stopped making profits and was spending its last resources. New contracts were out of the question. In the evening, he waited for his wife and Ashley to take them out to dinner. But they arrived home near midnight. Ashley was tired and went straight to her room. Mary didn't say a word to Martin and went to sleep in the living room. It went on like that for several days. Mary was certainly not prepared for such events. She could have quietly left for good in a burst of emotion, but she understood not to make a hasty decision in such matters. She really had nothing to say to Martin, so she gave him a silent boycott. After a while, Martineau began to seek some kind of reaction from his wife. Business at the company continued to deteriorate. The end of the month was approaching. The possibility of wage arrears persisted. Martin Hanks was torn on all fronts, but his fidgety actions brought no results. Only Michael supported him in everything. She did not take one step away from him in the office and offered a million ways out of the crisis. Of course, none of them were viable. When Martin Hanks voiced his displeasure about Michelle's visit to his wife, 
She turned on the lovelorn, unhappy and abandoned woman again, immediately starting to shed tears. Martin understood that even if she was fired, she would not stop causing problems. So he decided to postpone the matter for the time being, especially now the company had no possibility to hire a new secretary. Tell was in charge of all office matters in the council of everything that was going on. Martin Hanks felt a sharp fatigue. He needed time and quiet so he could figure out what was going on and sort things out on all fronts. So he rented a hotel room, packed his things, left a note on the kitchen table and moved out to live apart for a while. He spent the first two days of his isolated life in active negotiations with his colleagues and with copious amounts of alcoholic beverages. On the third day, he had a need to send an email of some kind. After sending the email, he forgot what he wanted to do next and just started leafing through the list, a few addresses he found very interesting. He wrote them out and very soon found out that these addresses belonged to the very potential companies that had refused him a partnership. He was even more surprised when he opened the contents of these letters. There were commercial offers from his competitors there for some reason. After thinking for a while, Martin Hanks realized what had happened and decided to deal with all this in the office, in the office in the coming days. In the meantime, he needed to meet urgently with several people his business friends had helped him find. These were prospective customers who knew the reputation of Mega House and its manager. Well, as a result of a series of negotiations, Martin still managed to get a couple of contracts. Michelle had been calling him persistently the whole time. She reasoned that she was worried because he hadn't shown up at the office in a while. Martin Hanks, even when he figured it all out, was in no hurry to take her out for an honest conversation. He decided to wait until the new contracts were signed and then only proceed to implement important decisions. A couple of weeks later, Martin was already in the company of friends celebrating the signing of the first contract. He stayed late with his partners at a restaurant and returned to the hotel. A little tipsy, when he walked in, the staff informed him. The staff informed him that there was a delivery for him. He picked up a small gift box at the hotel reception, and when he opened it, he saw a note written in Ashley's handwriting. We're expecting you for dinner at 7, 0 p.m. At home, Martin looked at his watch and was horrified. It was approaching one o'clock in the morning, but he quickly raced home, buying two bouquets of flour on the way. Mary and Ashley were tired of waiting for him and had already gone to bed, but Martin insisted on a family dinner, despite the late hour. Aren't you even going to ask what we're celebrating? Mary asked. We usually have a celebration every day when we're together. No, we have a special occasion today. Ashley doesn't know yet either. I wanted to let you both know together. Martin went and woke up his daughter. She joined them at the table in joy. The wife reported that she had been to the doctor the other day. Mary decided to tell Ashley the occasion first. She made some finger gestures and facial expressions. Ashley sat in silence for a while, then took a deep breath and gave out. Daddy, is it true that I'm going to have a brother or sister? Ashley herself was shocked by what had happened. Martin Hanks even shed a few tears. In part, the news of his wife's pregnancy made Ashley so happy that she finally spoke. This productive day flowed smoothly into a festive family night. Michelle was worried when she found out that she was pregnant. Although she knew how to influence Martin, she had great doubts about announcing her pregnancy to a man. Not an easy task for a woman who has no special rights for that man. With the onset of a new working day, Martin Hanks called Michelle in first thing. She didn't have time to open her mouth and show him the ultrasound results that confirmed her pregnancy. Martin Hanks started the conversation himself. Michelle, two months ago, why were you sending out our competitors' commercial proposals to our potential customers? Michelle tried to immediately make up a story that Maria's computer had broken down and that she could have sent these emails, but it was useless to deny it. Martin Hanks had already had a talk with Maria on neutral territory and clarified all the circumstances. Maria, who had earlier resigned from the company voluntarily due to a series of failures, had been reinstated. 
Michelle didn't know about it yet, so all her arguments fell apart as soon as Maria walked into Martin Hank's office and told her version of what had happened. Maria's computer, of course, never broke down, but Michelle was seen taking pictures of Maria's desktop, Maria's computers, many times. Already in the afternoon, Michelle received a full paycheck and her papers in her hands. She gathered her personal belongings from her desk and leisurely loaded into her car. Harry caught up with her in the parking lot. He told her that he, too, had quit his job to keep Michelle company. What are your future plans? asked Harry. I have no idea, said Michael in an unconcerned tone. Is there anything you want to tell me? Harry kept up with her. What can I tell you? Is there anything you don't know about me? Michael asked. Yes. As the most attentive man in the world, I know everything about you. And you know it too. All that's left is for you and me to say it to each other and decide on our future plans. Michelle knew it was pointless to ignore Harry any longer. Especially right now, all his insistence on attention was very flattering. But you turned out to be a stubborn guy and you got your way after all. I'm pregnant and congratulations to you. Harry was immensely pleased. He had been watching her closely since Michelle's parents' anniversary and had been looking forward to the news. 